Our guest in this segment is Kelly Allen from the West Virginia Senator on Budget and Policy. Kelly, good morning. How are you? Good morning. Doing well. How are you? Excellent. Thank you. Are you in transit at the moment? I'm not. Do I sound bad? No, I, it's, I just heard a little bit of noise off of the room noise. I didn't know if you were driving or not. No, the signal is great. I'm sitting in my office. Yep. You, you never sound bad, Kelly. Oh, you said <laughs> shameless. You. <laughs> Sucking up that my co-hosts do at times. Uh, also, uh, Maria Lawrenson is with us as well, Kelly. So let's, uh, we just had uh, Jason Upman from Americans for Prosperity on the program, and he was going over their agenda items for the 2025 legislature, in which he pointed out that it's the first time since the de- uh, de- days of the Depression that the Republicans, if Patrick Morrissey wins, and it's expected based on the way West Virginia votes that he would, that West Virginia would have a Republican governor, Senate, and uh, uh, House of Delegates as well. So with that in mind, their agenda items include lowering taxes and cutting spending and regulatory reform as well as fixing health care and expanding education uh, freedom. Uh, I think the part about lowering taxes and cutting spending is going to go against what you're telling me the state's priority should be, Kelly, especially with the governor now proposing that we go up to 8 or 9% with the next state income tax cut. Well, yeah. I mean, I think there are clearly some needs uh, that need to be met in our state that have not been addressed before we start considering more tax cuts. But I also think that uh, Republicans and Americans for Prosperity and other organizations are going to see their own priorities come into tension with one another. Uh, it's hard for me to imagine a world where West Virginia can afford to continue reducing the personal income tax and essentially fund two separate education systems that are universal. That's what we're talking about with uh, the expansion of the Hope Scholarship to Universal, which we also hear a lot of Republican leaders and organizations like AFP say that they support. Um, how, how can we hold all of those priorities at one time? I think, you know, we're really going to see how that's going to work out and effect over the next couple of years. What uh, was your response to the governor asking for the trigger, which is at 3 or 4%, to be bypassed and another 5% to be added to the personal income tax cut? Well, I, I, again, I was really shocked by that, and I was really heartened to hear, you know, President Blair and Senate Finance Chair Tarr kind of say, whoa, 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 we've got to take this into consideration with uh, other other needs uh, and what the effect of that could be on public services. Um, it was, I, I kind of had two responses. One is that, you know, a 3 to 4% income tax cut trigger, we're waiting for the final analysis once the Revenue Department releases the exact figures, but we think that's going to be something like, less than a dollar a week, about 85 cents uh, to the average West Virginia household, not individual, but to the household. Uh, and if you double that and give the governor, you know, his his additional proposal, we're talking about a couple bucks a week. You know, largely that's that's not going to even be noticeable to West Virginia households. It's not going to be enough to make child care more affordable, you know, to reopen child care centers that have closed, to address the needs of our folks. But the bigger tax cut obsession and trigger um, built into the 2023 tax law is actually kind of creating paralysis uh, in budgeting and in decision making. We saw, you know, the budget enacted this year for fiscal year 2025 was about $200 million below the revenue estimate. And we know lawmakers are trying to leave space for more tax cuts. But that also means that broadly popular legislation was not able to move. Things like investments in child care, funding for EMS agencies, uh, funding for school, school support staff. Um, and it's kind of creating this tension where lawmakers aren't doing things that the public is saying that they want because they're kind of measuring, like, you know, what, what, which is it that we're going to prioritize? It's going to be really hard to do both. Kelly, I know when you look at it incrementally that a, a couple of bucks a week isn't going to be noticed by most people in their paychecks if you have two, three, four, five dollars extra uh, per paycheck. But is it not also the responsible way to ultimately, over however many years it takes, phase out the personal income tax, which is the goal of the Republicans, most of them in the legislature and in the governor's mansion. If you're going to cut that tax, doing it in slight increments so the growth in revenues can absorb that difference, isn't that the more responsible way of doing it than slashing it all at once? Well, I think 
that's that's one way of of uh, putting it, and I think that was the justification for building these automatic triggers into the into the tax cut law in 2023. But I think it's also hamstringing future lawmakers. You know, Governor Justice made this proposal on his way out the door. He's not going to be the one to have to deal with these consequences. And then I just keep going back to this kind of like uncertainty that it's creating. Um, we would like to see the triggers repealed altogether, and for lawmakers to decide in the moment whether more tax cuts are affordable. Because what's happening right now with these tax cuts being automatic is they, they go to the front of the line, right? We don't know until July if we're going to trigger up to $200 million more in, a ta- in tax cuts for the next fiscal year that lawmakers have already passed a budget for. So that's just creating this like deep uncertainty uh, that I think we're seeing. I think the proof is in the pudding that there's a lot of good bills that have been pretty broadly agreed upon that aren't able to move. Uh, and I think those are things you know, that would serve more families uh, in a bigger way, making childcare more affordable, making sure emergency responders can come when you need it. Those would have a bigger impact on families by and large than a couple bucks a week. Your point about the timing is a good one, and it's one that the legislature Mm -hmm. has noticed as well, and they are adjusting the timing of that because uh, right now it's tough to set a budget when you don't know what the revenues will be because the trigger doesn't kick in until a certain date. Uh, Maria Lawrence, go right ahead. So uh, talk a little bit more, Kelly, about um, about making or having these tax cuts be affordable. I mean, you've mentioned a couple of pieces, child care, um, you know, obviously there are impacts there. What else um, does the tax cut um, impact in your mind's eye? Well, I think, you know, in a lot of ways, the conversations that we're having are about maintaining the status quo. Uh, we we talked about child care. Uh, the, the Department of Health is saying they need, you know, $23, $25 million to maintain current levels of child care subsidies or 2,000 families could lose um, their, their seats. Uh, we're talking about, you know, I think there was a big story yesterday about how federal ESSER, like COVID-era education funding is expiring, and we're talking about upwards of 1,000 school staff. Um, losing, uh, losing their jobs and how that will mean less support in our public schools. Um, I mentioned EMS agencies. We're the only state of our neighboring states that doesn't provide state dollars to emergency medical services, and there are a lot of EMS agencies saying that that is, um, uh, you know, they're, they're in crisis and there have been a lot of closures. Uh, and we also have the worst child welfare crisis in the country. We have the most kids in foster care, um, and I think both foster families and that foster children and biological families uh, need more support. So these are all things, yeah, that that I think most people would agree upon that are really important that are uh, not being addressed. And then again, tax cuts, uh, I think President Blair and Chairman Tarr threw cold water on these tax cuts a little bit because of already enacted spending, things like the HOPE Scholarship and the Third Grade Success Act and maintaining the status quo in child care. But I think you know, from our perspective, there's there's more that could be done. We could serve more families uh, uh, in the child care system if we dedicated more dollars to it and help more folks get to, back to work. And by and large, these are things that uh, would have a bigger impact on the economy, have a bigger impact on businesses uh, locating to West Virginia. When we talk about wanting families and businesses to locate here, um, they largely want the same thing. They want good schools. They want educated and healthy workforce. They want strong infrastructure and emergency response. So these are things that um, could build the state that we want to see in a more sustainable way than tax cuts that really don't make a difference unless you're very, very high income. Kelly, a lot of the discussion we've had around tax cuts, hope scholarships, and others have been done in isolation. In other words, been talking about the advantages of that particular program. Uh, has your office or has your group uh, tried to look at these various needs in a relative manner? In other words, uh, you've mentioned child care, the number of families that would be affected, education, uh, a component of education, the number of families would be affected. Uh, so in other words, words, looking at them in isolation, look at them corporately across the board. Have you done that? We have a little bit. Um, during the debate in 2023, we uh, we kind of showed that a lot of the surplus that the state was using to justify tax cuts 
were, was money that was already accounted for if you looked out a few years in terms of already implemented legislation obligated spending, stuff like the expansion of the HOPE scholarship uh, and the pulling back of federal COVID dollars that were kind of filling in holes in the state budget. We were getting a lot of extra money for Medicaid from the feds, a lot of extra money for education from the feds. That's all starting to expire now. So there's a lot of responsibilities coming back onto the state at the same time that these state uh, tax cuts were implemented. So I think we're really going to start to feel the pinch from that. But uh, there's more to be done to look at it holistically, I think, from us and from the legislature. Uh, and one, you know, one other concern that lawmakers should take into account is that the Justice Administration has not released a six-year spending plan uh, since 2020. Uh, it sounds nerdy, but historically, the governor's administration has talked to each agency and said, okay, what's on the horizon over the next several years? What do we need to know as we're planning responsibly uh, to be fiscally responsible with tax cuts and with spending? Uh, and that's something that hasn't been released. Uh, and lawmakers have been pretty upset about that. I hope the next governor will bring those spending forecasts back. Uh, but I think it also shows the absurdity to ask lawmakers to kind of jump off the cliff with more tax cuts when, one, the governor's not going to be here anymore. Uh, but two, he hasn't provided that base level holistic information that we all need to make responsible fiscal decisions. I, I'm not sure I asked my question correctly, and I'm not sure you gave <laughs> me an answer. Uh, is there any organization that looks at all the needs and put them in some sort of weighted function. Uh, in other words, mm -hmm. uh, certain, uh, certain of the needs that is going to impact more people than another need. How can we do this holistically? Yeah, I mean, I think that's a really great suggestion. I, um, I think, yeah, that's something we've, we've had proactive policy recommendations and tried to quantify both the cost and the impact on people and would, would be happy to try to provide more information. But I agree. Uh, that's, that uh, would be helpful for folks to, to visualize, to have a real contrast between uh, tax cuts and uh, the public services that really, really benefit people and businesses in our state. Because right now, we, the public, are being asked to respond to an issue that's presented to us in isolation, all by mm -hmm. itself. We're not it's not asked to compare it to other other needs, and I'm not, right. and that's what I'm begging for. Something that would kind of <laughs> cut across the board of at least from your perspective, the relative importance. Well, I think just to to look at one specific thing. I mean, we kind of talk about that a lot in terms of public education. You know, the 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 Hope Scholarship um, will. Uh, likely be expanded in 2026 or soon, sooner uh, to be universal. And uh, according to the treasurer's estimates, uh, it looks like it'll cost about twice as much as we thought it would in the fiscal note. If 40,000 new families take advantage of it, it'll be upwards of 200, 250 million dollars a year. Uh, and yeah, what is the cost of that? Or the alternatives of investments in public schools, where over 90% of children in our state get their education. So, uh, so that's one example we tried to show, but definitely want to look at that more holistic picture as well. So Kelly, um, I asked this question um, of Jason before you. Do you believe, does your group, does the Center for Budget and Policy believe that expanding, um, one of his parameters was expanding educational freedom, aka expanding the HOPE scholarship and so forth. Is that to the detriment of public schools? Is that your feeling that, that this will have a very negative impact on public schools? Well, I think there's a, a big body of research uh, coming out in states across the country about just the, the impacts of vouchers programs like this and, and how successful they are as an alternative in terms of learning for, for um, kids or, or, and better outcomes. Uh, and I think there's you know, a lot of concerning data around that. But to your specific question, is this a choice? Um, you know, is this coming at the cost of something else? I think absolutely yes in an environment where we're also saying we're going to shrink the state budget, we're going to shrink the pie, and we're going to let the HOPE scholarship take an ever-growing chunk of the pie. I think there's no way to look at that as not competing with public education dollars. You know, the, the personal income tax brings in about $2 billion a year. Our public education system uh, at the state level cost about $2 billion a year. I don't think there's a way to eliminate the income tax and grow the HOPE scholarship without, you know, either 
uh, outright reducing public education or just kind of chipping a, chipping away at it. You know, we know there are needs in our public schools. We've got entire school districts that don't have a social worker, a school psychologist. Um, we know we're, we, we're seeing school closures in uh, counties, in Harrison County, places that you wouldn't expect. So um, there will be needed new investments that will potentially not be made as a result of that and potentially even outright disinvestment. Kelly Allen, our guest here from the West Virginia Center on Budget and Policy. Kelly, is it your belief that the majority of taxpayers in West Virginia right now are not interested in a tax cut and that this is an idea that's mostly being promoted by elected officials and being foisted upon taxpayers who don't really want the tax cut? Is that your belief right now? I think that um, folks are largely being... um sold an idea that is not going to be the reality. I think in January when folks see, you know, the tax cut that was triggered, well, I don't think they will notice it in their paychecks. So I think the concept of, of tax cuts might might sound good to folks, um, but in reality, the two-thirds of income tax cuts go to the folks in the top 20% of households in West Virginia. So uh, it, it really is limited uh, to who benefits from them. And I think, you know, people, I think we need to be honest about the trade-offs. I think that's somewhere where Senator Tarr, President Blair, have been pretty honest. You know, if we're going to do more tax cuts, that is going to be fewer public services. I think folks like Governor Justice has, have tried to say that we can have it all. Uh, and I think that is unfair to the public and unfair to, to taxpayers. And if um, they are on board, I think, you know, it might be because. Uh, but the, I guess cheerleaders of things like this, like Governor Justice, are not being honest about the trade-offs. I want to start my next point by just stating that I don't mean this personally as an attack against you, so please don't, don't take it personally. Uh, but I am always troubled when people tell me that I won't notice when I'm being given my tax-paying dollars back. So I, I pay into the pool and I get some back, and then someone comes along to tell me that you don't deserve it back because you won't even notice it when you get it back. I don't like that logic because it indicates that you know better than me as to how I'm going to use the money that's in my pocket. And it also implies that the government has an ownership and a right to my money. And while I know there are services that need to be paid for and provided, I also know that I pay a lot into that. And if I get a little bit back, and if I get a little bit more back because I make more, it's because I invested in my education or my trade or my skills to reach a certain point where I can make more. So I don't feel like I should be made to feel guilty that I'm getting more back because I pay more in. And I especially don't want to be condescended to by somebody who says I don't deserve it back because I make enough that I won't notice it or I don't make enough that I'm not going to get enough money back. Another dollar in my pocket is okay because it's really my money. You had to take it from me first before you gave it back to me. Kelly, that's what we fondly know as a Rob rant. I was just going to say, <laughs> wow, he went, he went to town. There you go. I didn't well, raise I my voice. I'm not, I'm not suggesting that folks are undeserving of tax cuts. I'm suggesting that um, it's, it's important for us to be you know, honest about which, which path truly, like, will give the average West Virginia family more. Uh, and if we are not able to, and which path will actually grow our economy? You know, if we're not able to meet the basic needs of all of the people of our state by providing quality public education, by providing quality infrastructure, by making sure that fire departments and emergency departments come when you need them, you know, is that worth, I think that that is, you know, worth more uh, to grow our economy, to make sure that we're a place where uh, people and businesses want to locate. You know, it's not at all about disagreeing with folks about whether they, what they deserve or what they don't deserve. It's just being really honest about what those trade-offs are. Um, and we have decided collectively that these are, you know, public services that we should collectively provide together and help grow our economy and help the people of our state. Uh, and when folks aren't honest, uh, folks in government about, you know, the cost of tax cuts to those public services, um, I find that troubling. Well, I think the bottom line is people want it all but don't want to pay for it. I mean, we have arguments here about the rain right. tax and the fire fee and um, everything known to man. And, you know, you you want the services, but yet do you really want to pay for the services? I mean, that's 
that's the crux well, and of that's it, why I think. people move to West Virginia yeah. from Maryland and Virginia Amen. because they're tired of paying a lot of taxes and then first thing they do when they come here is, is go, ask where why wasn't my snow plowed <laughs> that's right that's right well, I think that's such a great point you know we're hearing a lot about our tax competitive with competitiveness with neighboring states we're very competitive with Maryland and Pennsylvania and Ohio and they have you know double and triple our property taxes you know the income yep. tax alone is not isn't the only thing we've got sales tax and property tax and when you put those all together west virginia is very competitive with our neighboring states where we're not so competitive is you know uh funding for schools we fund Amen. far less per capita kelly i gotta cut you off because i'm out of time here thanks so much for yours <laughs> yes, today sir. though much appreciated thanks kelly all right thank you have a good day kelly allen from the west virginia center on budget and policy